I noticed that this scientific and medical network annual meeting for 6th to 7th July this year has called Shaping the Future of Consciousness Studies. Oh, I love that sort of thing. There's no way that I can now afford to go fly thousands of miles back to England or to join in something like that. But I can remember about 30 years ago, 1990, the Scientific and Medical Network held its um, annual general meeting right close to where I lived in Gloucestershire. Oh. And back then, what were they talking about? It was consciousness. I really enjoyed it. But the only thing I can sort of definitely remember about that time was there we were all enjoying talking about consciousness and discussing it when someone who I think of as an old man, though he's probably no older than I am now, said, excuse me, I don't think it's, we cannot discuss this seriously unless we first agree on a definition of consciousness. And I'm thinking, well, rubbish, we're really having a great discussion, we hadn't defined it. But it does raise that question, is consciousness a thing that needs to be defined, or is it enough just to recognise it? Some things are like that. I remember when the one time I was in a position to sort of buy, or at least take a mortgage and buy, a place to live in. And I went to the estate agent, and the first thing they wanted me was to define what I wanted. In other words, there was a form with all sorts of yes, no questions, you know, um, what was my price range, um, did I want to live in a cottage, an apartment, or whatever. And I chose what I was used to in the Cotswolds, you know, isolated cottage, um, and um, I don't mind if it's off the beaten track, and so on and so forth. And when they looked at all the things I'd chosen, they laughed. They said, in Hampshire, something like that would never be in your price range. It's very different from Gloucestershire. Uh, so I said, well, what have you got in my price range? And they took me to a one bedroom, top floor flat in a converted water mill just outside the city walls. And the moment I stepped in, I just knew this was perfect for me. My definition of what I wanted was meaningless compared with what I recognized as something that suited me. Similarly with beauty, I mean, if, if you asked me when I was 14 if I could define beauty, oh yeah, I could have done it then, because I was madly in love with um, Bridget Bardot. So I'd have said, yes, tall, blonde, athletic, blue eyes, etc., etc. And yet, years later, I fell, I lost my heart to someone who was short, black-haired, with a stub nose and a freckly face, and brown eyes. So much for definition. So, um, just as I obstinately refused to define magic when I wrote my years of magical thinking, or sosopomy, I'm not going to define consciousness, but I'm going to ask, what is it that we're recognising? And I realise that there's a variety of opinions on this. The most obvious, um, rather um, ignorant, or people haven't thought much about it, see it as a binary thing. You know, when you're asleep or in a coma, you're unconscious. When you're awake, you're conscious. At the other extreme, there's people for whom consciousness is actually quite an elite concept. It's an achievement. You talk about a conscious person. Now, in Simon's Town, they've just opened a new shop a week or so back called, I think it's called the Conscious Cooperative. And their consciousness means like woke. It's people who are respecting the environment who don't want to take away their stuff pre-wrapped in plastic bags and all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so it's a lot of sort of um, healthy, good for the environment things that are being sold there. So that idea goes back, oh, way back. I mean, Gurdjieff people talk about the fact that most people are really asleep and it's only with training and practice that you become conscious. 
a higher level of awareness. Now, in between those two, there's, I think, what most people who've thought about it say is that it's not a binary state or an, a, a sort of peak state, but consciousness is a whole spectrum. Going from, okay, I agree that when you're in deep sleep, I would say you're unconscious. But when you're dreaming, you are a little bit conscious. Definitely, yeah. You're aware of things, but um, you're not fully conscious because strange things happen and you're not surprised. You can say, hang on. Um, and it's very difficult to read things if you're in a dreaming sleep. And even in um, getting a bit more conscious in, uh, oh God, what's it called? Um, dreaming when you know you're awake. I've forgotten the term right now. Vivid dreaming, lucid dreaming, that's it. In lucid dreaming, um, you can make conscious decisions, that's more conscious. But still, it's not very easy to read a poster or something when you're lucid dreaming. And then when you're awake, and I agree that very often when we're awake, we're actually in a sort of half dream with where our minds are wandering. And then there are moments when you are intensely conscious. And then, of course, with development, you can achieve what I might call a higher consciousness. Now, um, just consider that difference between sort of daily thinking and dreaming and when you become really alert. One of the things I remember about learning to drive, it was a great training in awareness because when you first learn to drive, there's no way your mind can wander. You have to be so aware of the sounds of the engine, the sight of the road in front of you, um, the feeling of the car and the steering and, the, and the, where the um, pedals are and things like that. It's a real training in being alert. And as such, it's a rather wonderful meditation. And it's really when you've learned to, do, um, to uh, drive, that your mind starts wandering and you can drive along and sort of suddenly realize you've got there you know and your mind has been in somewhere else until a cat leaps in front of the car <laughs> for a moment suddenly you're vividly there in the moment very awake slamming on the brakes um quickly looking to make sure no one's going to crash into the back of the car and so on everything at once that is a heightened consciousness Phew. and you drive on and for a while you're still in that state of heightened consciousness and then you drift back into normality. So consciousness in that heightened sense is really a reaction to surprise. We've gone a bit further towards a definition. Consciousness is something that is increased when we are surprised. Now, let's go back, talk about what you might call theories of mind. What does it mean, this thinking? Now, I can imagine you might say to someone in a few days' time, I was watching Ramsey Duke speaking about consciousness the other day. And I can be a stickler and say, no, you weren't. Because you... Wherever you were, you weren't with me and you weren't watching me speaking about consciousness. No, you were watching a few moving pixels on a screen on your computer or your um, tele telephone. That's what you were watching. And then again, I could be even more as a stick and say, no, actually, what you were experiencing was your brain was creating a virtual reality experience of you were looking at me on a screen. That's what you felt you experienced, but actually it was all generated inside your brain. Now, you might say, oh, come on, you know, that's, that's going too far, you know. I mean, I was holding that um, telephone. I was watching uh, the image on the screen. I agree with that, yeah. But you see, 
Someone like Darren Brown, a hypnotist, might actually hypnotize you, hand you a pack of playing cards and say, this is your mobile and you are now watching Ramsey Dukes talking about consciousness on this mobile. And you might say, oh yeah, yeah, there I am, as a hypno hypnotized subject. So, you see, you can't absolutely say, what you can say is that is what your brain was creating. Um, but you can't honestly say that you know it was real and not something that brain was just creating. Um, but uh, generally, the virtual reality your brain creates, the experience you actually live, is something that lends itself to sensory verification. If while you're watching this on your screen, I said, do you realize it might not be real? It might just be something you're, a dream you're having. You would say, you could reach out and touch the screen and say, um, no, look, I can stop it, click. Um, I can start it again, click. Um, that shows it is real. Now that doesn't actually eliminate the possibility that you're still a hypnotized subject believing you're watching it. But it's true, this sort of sensory verification is an important thing to make you know that you're not actually dreaming. That's what distinguishes it from a dream. Now, I did do some videos about predictive coding, which I thought was a very interesting model of this process of thinking and experiencing. What predictive coding was about was the idea that what we experience is actually something which the brain generates not as a result of sensory input, but in advance what it expects to experience. Now, that might seem a funny idea until you realize it has an evolutionary advantage. You see, what we were brought up to think, or I was brought up to think, is that our senses bring information into the brain that then forms this experience that we have. But if you think about that, although it happens very, very quickly, what an enormous lot of information is involved in creating a three-dimensional experience. Could it all happen so quickly? And the answer is that what actually happens is the brain creates what it expects to see, what is the most probable thing it will see. And then the senses provide correction. If that seems a funny idea, just think about um, how high definition television works. You see, if you think of how many pixels there are in a, in a good television picture, about two million pixels per picture being um, altered at 25 times a second. Now, if the whole information for that had to come in, it would mean about 50 million pixels per second, which is a huge amount of data, especially as it's colored pixels. And you could possibly transmit that over um, normal uh, radio signals, things like that. It just couldn't handle that amount of data. So what the um, television system does is it compresses that data in the sense that, let's take an example of a football match, you know, those 25 pictures per second, all in high definition, between one picture and the next, at that speed, at 25th of a second, about the only thing that's moved is one ball has moved a tiny bit across the screen. Everything else is more or less as it was before. Even the runners in a 25th of a second, they haven't gone very far. So all this you have to transmit is the change from one picture to the next. And so that's how you can have a high definition image of a football game 
being viewed in real time, more or less. Now, I say more or less because, of course, if you change to a different camera, then suddenly you do have to change the whole picture. But there's a very slight time lag, and this is put into, um, God, what they call the thing, into a cache, uh, so that um, you've got just a little bit of extra time to build up the whole picture. Um, and so for the viewer, it's a smooth experience. And so what's saying is that um, our brains have evolved to do something similar. We experience, when you were watching me on screen talking about virtual reality, uh, what actually was happening, you were seeing what you expected to see from moment to moment. And it was only as my words came in, the picture was being kept up to date is being updated with what I was actually saying and how I was moving. And if you think, how has this evolved? Is it, it's an evolutionary advantage. Because you had two creatures, one of which was taking in all the sensory information and building that picture in its brain of what's likely to happen. And the creature that was about to pounce on it, or, or it was about to pounce on, simply um, took the existing scene and just added the new information that something was moving towards it, then obviously that system could react much quicker. So you can see there's an evolutionary advantage in this predictive coding. So what I'm saying is the definition we're getting towards of being conscious is to be engaged in correcting predicted experience. You see, while I was driving, while my mind is wandering, everything was very predictable. We're going down the street, you know, it's from moment to moment, it's the same street, you're the same car, same feeling, and suddenly a cat leaps out. Um, that's what you react to. And for a moment, you're very, very conscious because you've been forced into consciousness because something unexpected has happened. You're very alert for a, short, for a short time, you're very alert. Now I say, what if instead of a cat leaping across the road, an octopus leapt across the road? <coughs> the same shock, the same instant peering. What, have I really seen that? But it would go further. You might actually get out of the car, stare hard, you might even reach out and prod it to see, God, it really is there, it really is an octopus. See, when we're at our most conscious, I'm suggesting, is when magic happens. And what generally happens is, okay, you prod, my God, it really is an octopus. And then you start thinking of a reason I mean, you've got to get on with the journey I and mean, you can't just hang around forever. Uh, oh, there's a there's an aquarium just up the road. Oh, it's obviously escaped. I'll just ring them up and tell them there's an octopus on the road. And then you drive on. But you're still more conscious than you were if just a cat had jumped over. You know, you'll be telling your friends about it. You say, yeah, yeah, it really was an octopus. I prodded it, you know. Um, that bit of magic, you're, you've responded with consciousness. And you can only really relax when you've thought up some explanation. Perhaps it was a practical joke. Perhaps Darren Brown had hypnotised me and a post-hypnotic suggestion I would see an octopus crossing the road. Something to get rid of the magic and you can get on with your life. So I say, I'm suggesting our brains have evolved to protect us from magic. And that is the function of consciousness. I said something like this in one of the essays in Blast Your Way to Megabucks, where I asked, why is there so little magic in the world? And I said, the answer is because we've become such good magicians. And I gave examples like, um, you know, at that time, there was great excitement about Yuri Geller, you know, um, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could hold a piece of metal in your hand and by concentrating on it and nothing else, it could bend and go soft and bend. Wow, 
Many people wanted to be able to do that. And I pointed out that it would be dead scary if we could do that. Because if you're up in an aeroplane and you are aware that this aeroplane is made of metal and you are aware that you mustn't concentrate on the metal because it might make it bend suddenly you're in a very very dangerous world because how can you stop yourself from concentrating when the very thought of that metal bending is enough to make the whole airplane crash and you to die or even just driving a car you know the bits of metal so i said that what i suggested is that um we have such strong beliefs about the world and how it should be and the f they're so strong that we can enforce those beliefs and so we're brilliant magicians we're shaping the world to be a safe place. We only experience what should happen. And if magic should happen, or if magic does happen rather, our brains have evolved to explain it away and so normalise experience. And um, I've often given the example of the ghost I saw when I was in Emmanuel College. You know, a very scary ghost, but... I just stared at it. I didn't move my head or my eyes and it sort of melted into the background of a swirly curtain. And so I'd been provided by this normalizing explanation. I just imagined this shape out of the swirly background curtain. And the point is that when I kept staring, I couldn't recreate that image out of that swirly curtain. In other words, something one way had happened. Normally, if it's an optical illusion, when you've seen it, you can go to and fro between the illusion and the reality. You know, you can see the ink blot as a girl reading a, a book, and then you can see it as an ink blot, and you can move to and fro. But this time, I couldn't. And that told me that something had happened, like a sensor. And I wrote about it somewhere. I thought it was in Thunder Squeak, but... Um, I think somewhere earlier I call this the great abortionist. This principle of intense awareness or consciousness which removes magical experience. And so that's the beginnings of a definition of consciousness. It is um, a process by which we eliminate magic. Raise a question perhaps as are only humans conscious? Imagine a bee going towards a flower for nectar. It lands on it and discovers it's a plastic flower. Now, I would say that at that moment, the bee becomes conscious that its prediction was wrong. What about a leaf flapping to and fro in the wind on a tree? Regular rhythm, then suddenly splat, it is hit by a raindrop. Who's to say it doesn't have a moment of consciousness as it has to cope with that break in what is normal? This predictive coding, this scripting, requires the ability to calculate what is most likely to happen and a memory for comparing. Now, as I pointed out, um, certainly in Sosogamy, I think in Thunder Squeak, that a free particle in space can calculate. It's an analog calculator because if several forces act on it, it will move off, it will accelerate in a certain direction, which is a calculation of the resultant of those forces. It's an analog computer. And it also has memory because that was I can't remember which order of Newton's laws it is, but one of Newton's laws is that it will accelerate away proportional to the force on it. And it would have calculated the resultant of all those forces. And I only learned to do vector calculation like that, at vector addition, when I was doing, I think it was uh, A-level mathematics. So it's no small feat. But that particle also has a memory and it's called conservation of momentum. It will continue along that lines um, until something else happens. So what I suggested is that um, uh, the roots of awareness, thinking, 
are everywhere really. So to me, it isn't um, so fantastic to assume that this predictive ability is everywhere. And so maybe consciousness is throughout the universe. It hasn't proved it, but it suggests some element of consciousness, which may be very low on the spectrum of consciousness that I've described, it could be absolutely universal. In other words, throughout our universe. So let's look closely at that moment of surprise when the picture has to be readjusted. And so I suggest that it requires a number of characters to do this. You have the writer director who creates the prediction of what should happen. You're driving along the road and there's a road just continuing as it should be. You have the camera which actually records, it's your senses, records what has happened. And the camera picks up an anomaly. Suddenly there's a cat leaping across the road. And you have a producer who says whether this is allowed to happen or whether it's got to be cut and refilmed. And you have a viewer who simply experiences the result with wor worrying about this production process. And what I've been describing, this sort of intense, um, hang on, I can't be an octopus, oh my God, it is, is the utter certainty test. When you, you blink your eyes and you touch and you listen and all your senses are alert to verify if this really is happening. And then the great abortionists will come in and make sure there's some explanation so they can get rid of it. So what's this got to do with magic? What's this got to do with magic? Well, let's imagine that you're coming home from your grandfather's funeral and you go into his house where they're going to hold the reception. You're the first person to go in and it's in semi-dark. And you go into the sitting room and out of the corner of your eye, there's your grandfather sitting as he should always used to be in his favorite chair by the fire. Your director has produced what it thinks is the most likely thing. But of course, the producer is saying, hang on, stop, stop, stop. This isn't allowed. You've just been to his funeral. He can't be there. And the camera, you reach up and switch on the light turn and stare intently under the bright light and of course he isn't there it's just you realize it was an illusion of the shadows that's what the producer says and so you can go on with your life it's been restored to normality the producer says i'm sorry dead grandfather back in his chair is unacceptable society won't accept that Physics won't accept that. If this would allow, if this sort of nonsense were allowed, it would corrupt our society. And the writer director says, well, why not test it by trying it on the public to see if they're really corrupted? No, 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 says the producer. Turn on the light, refilm it. Better camera, better lighting. Yeah, gone. But what if it might actually, instead of corrupting society might inspire a public debate and people become less afraid. Now, when I wrote in I See How to, how to, how to See Fairies, I suggested a series of exercises designed to quieten the censor and open up the senses to a richer experience, to allow the cameraman to see more interesting things and the writer-director to write them in. Does that mean getting rid of the producer of the censor. No, no, no. It means just telling him to step back and not dominate the team. At that moment of surprise, when consciousness is at its most intense, we are suspended it's a form of 
free energy that has not yet turned into experience. It's a fleeting moment of power that might be used for magic. What I'm saying is, although the producer is saying, no, no, this isn't allowed, you know, it's, it's against um, religious ideas, it'll make you a... Before the phone rang, I was saying that at that moment of surprise, you're suspended and that it, there's a sort of free energy there that has not yet turned into experience, has not yet precipitated. It's a fleeting moment of power and you might be able to use it. Going back to my example of you just come into the room after your grandfather's funeral and you haven't yet turned up turned on the light your hand is up on the switch now if your corner of your eye you can see him sitting in his normal chair and this is the point where the producer says no cut cut we can't have this woo woo nonsense this won't be accepted um, we can't this, the critics will pan this movie so please turn on the light Get the camera one to look hard at this chair and we'll see that there's nothing there. I'm saying stop at that moment. Don't follow what the producer says. Don't switch on the light. Don't move your head to stare at the chair containing your grandfather. Instead, say and you can say this out loud through your mouth or maybe sort of loud inside your head. Hey, Grandad, I'm really pleased to see you there because we've been missing you like anything. And then you wait and listen. And if you're really good at this, you might hear a voice in your ear, but more likely you will just hear the words coming into your head, which might be like this. Yes, I've been missing you too. So you say, Grandad, are you okay? And you might hear him say, well, quite honestly, after the pain of the last few days of my life, this is heaven. Now, at some point you have to turn on the light because the other guests are arriving, but um, you, the viewer, have taken, have begun to participate in the movie. The producer is saying, no, 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 we want an um, a, a acceptable movie for general release. We don't want any nonsense that will embarrass the sense of, you know, the, the, um, the reviewers and, and make fun of this stupid movie um, and you're saying no I actually would like to have a bit more in this movie basically you're making an art house movie for a more limited audience because the producer is quite right if you announce to everyone hey I've seen the ghost of my grandfather <laughs> people would think you might have gone a bit off your rock old poor chap you know grief hits people in different ways but if you choose the audience carefully and th through knowing your audience and who would accept this or who would like to know this, if say you told your grandmother quietly when she's on her own what you'd experienced, she might find it very comforting. Even if she only sort of, you know, thinks it's a fantasy, she might like to hear that. You're making an art house movie for a very select audience, yourself and one or two others who could appreciate it. So to sort of extend this as a way, if you're one of these people who has very great difficulty in sort of, you know, I'd like to have magic in my life, but I just know it's impossible. Start with some, do a ritual, do something very simple like a tarot reading. Now, the producer in you will be saying, oh, no, come on, you know, this is mumbo-jumbo, this is new age crap. Um, 
don't waste your time. But you say, no, I'm going to do this with an open, uncensored mind, just to see what happens. What does the camera actually record when you do that? Well, sure enough, you'll probably get a certain amount of banal statements. You'll probably get some that you don't understand and some that just don't make sense. But from my experience, you're also quite likely to get something really quite thought provoking. that seems to be surprisingly relevant to the question you put. Um, but the produce usually would look at the overall thing and say, oh, no, look at all this meaningless rubbish. Um, you know, I told you the tarot was nonsense. But this is, see, you, you remake the movie for the limited audience of yourself. And you might well find it very useful. And the skill of doing this increases. Next time you do the tarot, you may do it with a little more confidence and you get even better results. That's how very often is a way one can get into practicing magic. Just catching that moment of surprise and allow it to happen. This was illustrated in um, Don Juan's uh, the teaching, Carlos Castaneda's The Teachings of Don Juan, when they went out into the desert. I think it was in that first novel, the first of his novels. And um, they went out at dusk, you know, a time of great mystery. and. Don Juan in the desert saw a monster reared up, it was terrifying. And he was very proud because he kept his rationality, walked towards it, staring hard, and sure enough, it turned out to be just a dry tree stump or so, a bush or something. And he was pleased, you know, he showed that he's made of solid stuff. But Don Juan ticked him off. He said, you destroyed the magic. You had an opportunity there. You destroyed it. And that's the sort of what I'm suggesting. So, to conclude this bit, the limits of our magical ability are actually there for our protection. Not just to make our environment more reliable and safe, but save us being thrown out of our society. We actually need a police force but we don't want a police state. So the beginning of magic is to bend the rules a bit rather than break them. You see, consciousness has got survival value for those who have it. It, it, it protects us. It is doing something useful, but we've reached the stage where actually we are finding it frustrating. I remember in Britain when they introduced the crash helmet compulsory for motorcyclists and probably a very good decision saved a lot of lives but I know myself I went faster when I wore a crash helmet because when the wind is streaming in your hair you don't particularly want to go very fast because there's so much physical sensation you're getting from just cruising along but when you've got this muffled thing over you and goggles and you're all closed in, there's much less sensation, much less awareness of what's happening. So you go faster to get the equivalent buzz. And I think that we're reaching that stage where our lives are so safe that we want something more. Our imaginations haven't got enough room to play. So I suggest that this consciousness has got a function for us humans and as I suggested maybe all aspects of material existence benefit from a consciousness which is constantly um, keeping it safe, keeping the world behaving right. But um, does the universe itself need consciousness? You see some people who argue for um, study the actual sort of neural mechanisms behind consciousness, they say that your un unconscious actually knows before you become conscious of it what it's going to do. And that, so you don't actually need consciousness in that sense. What I mean is that all that calculation could take place without 
that higher sense of awareness, I am here, I am a being. Why do we do that? Why do we need it? Why not just have a nice universe that works deterministically, automatically, and everything works in place? Now, in exploring that idea, I refer back to what I said about virtual reality in a series of earlier videos. And I explained how my ideas of virtual reality had evolved. In around 1970, I had the idea that we might be living in a virtual reality. And I suggested because it might have provided a solution. And the example I gave was that um, uh, overpopulation could become such a crisis that the only, this was before the days of sort of Martian travel and things that we're talking about now, back then, the only thing we could do would be to build a virtual model, model of um, the world as it was back at the birth of civilization, in other words, the Neolithic times. Multiply that um, model millions of times and then sp download people's consciousness into it, sp spreading people out over millions of similar universes. And then people would start to be born into this new world and it could be the world we're living in now, which would explain some of the mysteries of why, you know, Stonehenge seems to have such sophisticated um, uh, mathematics behind it and things like that. Yeah. By 1980, I'd improved that, uh, and I realized it was rather more likely that if we're living in a virtual world, it would have been an experiment. And I suggested that, you know, scientists were trying to find a theory of everything, the laws of physics, finally, which would explain all um, physical phenomena. And the only way, practical way, to test that would be to model it by running it as a model in a computer. And of course, uh, the only way to actually sort of answer all the objections of uh, theological objections would be to run it not just to see that um, stars and planets in, um, formed, but that life eventually emerged on some of those planets and that it evolved into intelligence life. And really the only sort of the nearest you can get to a clinching argument would be if some of these intelligent beings um, themselves worked out the laws that have been programmed into their universe and themselves modeled it in another virtual reality, creating a cascade of virtual realities. Um, and then I came up with Johnson's Paradox, in which case it's very unlikely we should just happen to be in the, first, the top one. Um, so that was my sort of 1980 argument. But towards the end of the 80s, I began to think, do we actually need a creator at all? Um, and I thought of this analogy of this um, idea that uh, life evolved in a chemical soup. And I said, following that sort of model, the way structures emerge in the chaos of a chemical soup, might not structures emerge in a chaos that didn't have a physical substrate, a chaos of data. Now, um, you see, how do you picture a chaos of data? Is it like uh, the heat death of the universe, particles whizzing around, you know, totally? And I say no, because as soon as you have particles, they are entities with known properties. A real chaos would have to be pure data with no physical substrate. So what do I mean, like, um, like in a computer or something? No, because digital data is too defined. It's zeros and ones. A real chaos, the chaos out of which the universe grow, I think would be analog data, utterly shapeless, formless, in, um, continuous, just a soup of analog data working around. And out of that would emerge structures. Now you might say, oh, well, if structures emerge, it isn't really chaos, is it? Ah, no, because as soon as you lay down a rule like chaos may not contain structures, you've limited chaos, you've constrained it. No, real chaos 
would include in, in over infinite lengths of time emerging structures the equivalent of living cells uh, amino acids and things building up to living cells appearing in a chemical soup and i suggested that some of these structures would be ones which have, were held together by having an internal meaning or significance in other words they would be virtual universes So out of primal chaos emerges structured chaos, which we would call data, out of which emerges information that can form a higher level of meaning we call a virtual universe, in which can emerge beings that can experience that virtual universe. Chaos becomes data, becomes information, becomes reality, becomes experience, and consciousness is a form of experience. So, back to this question of, yeah, but why this actual sort of awareness we associate with consciousness? I am me here. Wouldn't a deterministic virtual reality work just as well, one where simply you know, all words, work, all, everything worked out unconsciously? Now, going back to this emerging structure, which we call a universe, really, its vital survival trait is stability, its structure. Just as the living cell survives because it, it holds itself together, it doesn't just fritter away. Just as life needs to develop its immune system in order to hold itself together, you know, a structure of cells, it develops an immune system which keeps out all the viruses and things which are trying to um, disorder or which are liable to uh, make it disorganized and to break down. I suggest so does virtual reality, a surviving one, needs to debug itself, especially if it came out of analog data without the checksums of digital data. So in that case, consciousness is needed as a means to debug the reality by stopping its structural laws from being broken. In other words, to stop magic from happening. Now, again, back to this question, what's this got to do with magic as a practical thing? Well, at first sight, what I've said suggests the utter impossibility of magic. The whole universe is stacked against it. It's holding itself together. It's making sure its physical laws don't get broken. But remember that in that model, we are part of that very program that underlies the whole universe. Just as we can, as individual viewers, can learn to bend the rules by not allowing the producer to dominate the movie, so we might learn how to participate in the universe we inhabit by using these moments of surprise and free energy that I described. You see, as part of the software, we actually could develop our access to higher levels of the software. So it means we can recognize the extent to which magic can be allowed as long as it doesn't threaten the structure of the universe. Remember, in the smaller scale, when I told example of making your movie experience after the death of your grandfather into a um, art house limited audience rather than a general release one. You found a way of keeping the magic without destroying the social structure by um, alienating yourself as a weirdo. So what extent can we do this without destroying the structure of the universe? Say you were retired, you were suffering from cancer and you go to a lonely place do a traditional ritual, evoke a spirit of visible manifestation and ask it to heal your cancer. And then let's say over a few months, the cancer goes into remission. Have you destroyed the structure of the universe? No, 
any doctor would say, this can happen, you know. Other people say, what a coincidence if they did know about your ritual, but shh, don't tell them. Now, wow, if you could do that, let's repeat the process before television cameras and an audience of millions, or let's do it under strict laboratory conditions before a team of scientists. Then I suspect it wouldn't work. Because that, the first, would cause a breach in our society and what the society thinks can happen. And the second, the laws of physics don't currently allow that sort of thing to happen. You see what I mean by make sure your magic doesn't actually threaten the universe or society. That's a way to keep it going. Going back to this idea that consciousness involves a sort of instant of free energy before reality settles down around us. Austin Spare, in the book of Pleasure, he writes about something similar but on a, a bigger scale. He talks of a sort of free energy of belief when we become disillusioned. A fundamental belief is shattered. Someone we love rejects us. A theory or prediction is proven wrong. There's a feeling of great disappointment. The prediction hasn't worked out. You thought you had a great job ahead of you. You've got the sack. He says at that point, there's a sort of free energy of belief which can be used for magic. He says that's a very good time to do sigil magic when you're in that rather despairing state, which is interesting because of course that's probably the one time you don't feel like doing anything, you feel really low. But he says it's a powerful moment. <coughs> and so it fits in what I'm saying. I'm suggesting a sort of micro version of that. Instant of surprise when predictive reality is broken is a power to, you have the power, moment of power to consciously shape everyday experience into magical experience. So what have I done in this rather long video ramble? I started out with the Sound of a Medical Network uh, and their consciousness studies. And have I been doing a consciousness study? No, I've been exploring because consciousness studies, I'm sure, means having read lots of books about um, neurology, ontology, epistemology, or whatever, and knowing what a lot of what other people have said, what experiments have been conducted. And I haven't done any of that. I've just explored. What I've done has got very little value um, I wouldn't be invited to talk about consciousness studies to a group of people on the strength of this. But has it been a worthwhile exercise? When I was teaching at Eton, Eton had a system which um, is rather like the University at Oxford and Cambridge where you have a tutor who takes a special interest in your progress. Spent a lot of time with him, you know, invited around for sherry and everything. Well, actually the Eton system, I think, was the one that it inspired the college system rather than the other way around. And so I was a tutor to some boys and we used to spend time talking about many things, including the sort of stuff which interests me, which we've been talking about in these videos. And um, at least one of my pupils, went on to study Oxford, at Oxford, to study philosophy, um, which wasn't taught directly at Eton at the time. Um, and he, I envied him. I thought, oh, God, how lucky. I wish I'd done that. It wasn't so easy just to change your course when I went to university. Um, a year later, I asked him, and he was disappointed. And he said that the trouble with doing philosophy at university is that you're studying philosophy. Whereas what we were doing at school really was doing philosophy. We were thinking for ourselves and working things out rather than learning what other f famous philosophers had said. 
And actually, in society, that's really how philosophers are seen. You know, if, if the media invites a philosopher to comment, what they want is someone who knows what Kant said, what Wittgenstein said, what, who knows all that and can spout it. They don't actually want someone who just sort of explores ideas, because that person could be a crank, like me. Um, so, uh, what I've done has got personal value. I found it very interesting thinking through these things. And it may have value for, if it makes other people think, if you haven't thought of some of these things. But I can't really call it consciousness studies, I don't think, with a straight face. It's doing consciousness rather than studying it. Just as we've been looking at consciousness rather than defining it. I woke up this morning thinking about uh, what I'd said in this video and does it relate to the idea of gnosis put forward by Pete Carroll? In Psychonaut, there's a chapter called Levels of Consciousness and he describes rather as I have the idea of consciousness as a sort of spectrum and he talks about unconscious when you're fully asleep and the wake and then the dreaming state and then he calls, talk, talks about the robotic state and that's rather what I described when you're just driving down the street you know in half in a dream um, no surprises and then he says um, the level uh, Awareness occurs when the mind produces some non-automatic response to a stimulus. Some minds would only be provoked into awareness by unusual outside events. So that is like my surprise. Other minds may be able to self-stimulate themselves into awareness. Now that's true. I, I described how surprise brings you into that state of awareness. But of course, with practice, um, you can bring yourself into that state of awareness consciously um, as a deliberate act. I'm going to open up my senses, be very aware. That's the sort of thing, the state which I describe in How to See Fairies, the state of being intensely aware of everything, but not thinking. And that is like the level of gnosis occurs when the mind becomes intensely conscious of anything, says Big Carol. This is not the same as thinking intently about something. For in this state of intense awareness, thinking ceases and the object of consciousness holds the attention of the mind completely. That's exactly the state I was describing in How to See Fairies, where you go to a walk and you are very aware of all the senses coming in, but you're not labelling them. You're seeing an object in front of you and not thinking that's a gate. You're just seeing it as a, as a sensation. And that's what I'm talking about when um, we walk into, in my example, you walk into the room and in the half dusk there is Grandad sitting in the chair. Now it's the producer, uh, that is what one expects to see, that's what you had seen over many years. But the producer says, no, no, we can't have that because he's dead. You're not allowed to do that. Society wouldn't approve the critics would pan this movie if you leave that in and orders the cameraman to turn and, and focus intently and turn on the light to see that he really isn't there. Now that I'm describing something very like this gnosis. I think that's what it is. It is that you stop that thinking which says this isn't allowed. So what do you do with your senses? I agree that if you did turn on the light and focus and invoke the great abortionist, um, that, in, that absolute certainty thing, you will probably banish the magic. But I'm saying actually freeze and take in the sensations you're actually experiencing, which includes seeing Grandad in the shadow there. So you are tuning up your awareness but you're not focusing it in a way that banishes things um, and to me that is the state of gnosis I think um, Pete Carroll goes on to say the Gnostic level is the very font of magical powers and mystic states of consciousness 
Gnosis is intense consciousness of something, including the ideas of self or nothingness. Most extremes of emotionality, and not just the nice emotions, can initiate it, and so can a profound act of single-pointed concentration on something. A single-pointed concentration, yes, but what you're not doing is making that concentration into a banishing concentration. You're, I wouldn't say single-pointed, actually, it's just but so it's single pointed on this moment. There is Grandad. Don't move your eyes to stare at him. And then initiate the conversation. It's capturing that magical moment in a state of gnosis. Now, I just give this very naive example of, you know, uh, there's a ghost and how instead of banishing it, you communicate with it to see if something useful comes out. And I say what comes out might be very useful and very comforting for some members of the family. Of course, I'm meaning, it's just an example of a, a broader thing. Any magical act, whether it's doing a tarot reading or a ritual to make something happen, there is that point where um, something happens and a strong impulse in your mind, the producer, wants to explain it away. Now, at that moment of seeing the ghost, you see, the strong impulse in our society is to say, it can't possibly be, and banish it. But actually, to say, ah, oh, that is the spirit of my grandfather returned, that too could, it's not such a negative um, thought, but that thought too could spoil what happens. You might get some rather sort of, um, I don't know, second-hand spiritualist type of messages coming out like that. I'm just saying that you just hold that moment of surprise as its reality in itself. And I think that's very related to Big Carol's concept of gnosis. The other thing was that I mentioned um, the Austin Spare comparison. Um, uh, the words, this is in the Complete Ritual and Doctrine of Magic um, in the Book of Pleasure. Um, whether for his own pleasure or power, the fulfillment of desire is his purpose, he would terminate this by magic. Let him wait for a desire analogous in intensity. He then sacrifices his desire for its fulfillment to the initial desire. He's not obtained freedom from law. And then in the footnote, it said, this is a short formula of those whose belief is full in the law, a household is following their desires. The formula holds good for any purpose. What he means there is that um, uh, this is for people whom the producer is still dominant. You know, um, the law is what is allowed, what society says. And uh, um, so if we're still in that state, he says, wait until um, wait for a belief to be subtracted. That period when disillusionment has taken place, that was the state I was describing. Illustration, a loss of faith in a friend or a union that did not fulfill expectations. And I said the miniature version is the prediction of what should happen doesn't happen. A moment of surprise, brief disillusionment, when normally it will be explained away by the producer. Verily, disappointment is his chance. This free entity of belief and his desire are united to his purpose by the use of sigils or sacred letters. In other words, he says, grab that moment when um, uh, things haven't worked out and you're in that state, ah, and use sigil magic to put that free energy to what you want to happen. With that, I've gone over an hour. This is a thoroughly long um, video, but uh, I'm going to end on that. <laughs>